Welcome to Season 2 of Archeo Ed, a podcast about civilizations in the ancient Americas. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnhart, and for the last 30 years, I've been all over the Americas as an archaeologist, an explorer, and a seeker of esoteric knowledge. This podcast is just me, freed from the lecture podium and talking about subjects that interest me. Sometimes it'll be in-depth information about a narrow subject. Other times it'll be general information about a wide subject. Basically, it'll be anything I feel like talking about, because this is my podcast and I'm just having fun with it. So without further ado, let's get started. Season 2, Episode 1, Chaco Canyon. Chaco Canyon is a hot, dry, and barren place located roughly in the center of the modern-day state of New Mexico. Despite being an inhospitable place with a dearth of natural resources, it contains hands down the finest pre-Columbian architecture within the modern United States. The ancestral Pueblo people built it over a roughly 300-year period, from the 800s to the 1100s CE. They built what are called great houses in the canyon, out of sandstone blocks and timber. Collectively, thousands of rooms that could have supported a population of tens of thousands of people. But strangely, archaeology determined that few people actually lived there year-round. Instead, they gathered there en masse in certain occasions, and then they returned to their permanent homes elsewhere. It's called the Chaco Phenomenon, because what they did, how they did it, and why they did it, is still in many ways a mystery. The descendants of the people who built Chaco Canyon are still with us the Pueblo people. Today, there are about 35,000 Pueblo people living in 20 territories, each its own sovereign nation. Most are in New Mexico. The largest, the Hopi Nation, is in Arizona. We call their ancestors the Ancestral Pueblo. We used to call them the Anasazi, but we don't anymore. We don't because Anasazi is actually a Navajo word meaning ancient enemy. Early archaeologists spent a lot of time with the Navajo, who also live in the Southwest, and in greater numbers than the Pueblo people, hence the adoption of the term Anasazi. The unfortunate truth is that the name Pueblo is not the name of their culture either. That's the Spanish word for town, and it was applied to them in the 16th century by the first Spaniards who saw them living in towns. Originally, like most cultures in the world, they called themselves variations of the people. But since the Pueblo speak different languages, there's no one indigenous term they can agree upon. Thus, they've accepted the term Pueblo. But they do distinguish one nation from another by their own names. Hopi, Zuni, Akama, Zia, etc. Aside from the tricky issue of how to respectfully refer to their modern descendants, they know, and archaeologists agree, it was their ancestors who built Chaco Canyon. But as far as how or why, their oral traditions don't say much about it. They do share an interesting legend about a man referred to as the Gambler, but I don't really have time to go into the whole Gambler story here. I suggest you Google the Gambler Pueblo and you'll find some very interesting information. But before we go forward, let's back up a minute and talk about how the ancestral Pueblo people got to the point where they could build the amazing great houses of Chaco Canyon. They didn't just wake up one day as master architects. People have been living in the Southwest for at least 12,000 years, probably longer. In fact, the first widely accepted evidence of what archaeologists call Paleo-Indian culture was found in New Mexico. The two main Paleo-Indian cultures, called Clovis and Folsom, are both named for sites within New Mexico, where they were first documented about a hundred years ago. They were hunter-gatherer cultures who hunted megafauna like mammoths and bisons between 12 and 9,000 years ago. When the climate warmed and the megafauna died off, 
life in the Southwest transformed into what we call the archaic. For thousands of years, those people, like their Paleo-Indian predecessors, lived nomadic lives. They lived only temporarily in open campsites or caves as they roamed in seasonal rounds, moving wherever resources were best from one season to another. The region was much more green and lush back then, especially the San Juan Basin where the ancestral Pueblo people would eventually prosper. But about 3,500 years ago, it began to dry out, eventually becoming the desert we see today. Population decreased, but not to zero. The people that stayed adapted, and since there were less big animals to hunt, they relied more on gathering plants. Archaeology sees more grinding stones for grinding seeds and more baskets for carrying plants. It was about then that the concept of corn farming arrived to the southwest from central Mexico. We have pretty good evidence that corn was there as early as 2100 BCE. Some researchers put it even earlier. But for a long time, the nomadic people of the southwest didn't really seem to care about corn. In fact, it wasn't really until about 100 BCE that we see them doing any significant farming. But once farming does take hold in the southwest, things begin to change. The biggest thing is that they start living year-round in what archaeology calls sedentary communities. It's right about then, roughly the BCE to CE switchover, that three distinct culture regions develop in the southwest. The Mogollon, the Hohokam, and the Ancestral Pueblo. This podcast episode is about Chaco Canyon and the Ancestral Pueblo, so I won't say much about the other two cultures here, but in brief. The Mogollon lived in southern New Mexico and northern Mexico, mostly in the dry desert mountain regions. They were a lot like the Pueblo people, but distinct enough to designate them a separate culture. The Hohokam lived mainly along two rivers running through Arizona, the Salt and the Gila rivers. Because they had those big rivers, they built amazing aqueducts and irrigation systems. That in turn made their settlements, their material culture, and their way of life quite different from the Pueblos. The Hohokam were amazing, and at some point I will give them a whole podcast episode. But for now, let's stay focused on the ancestral Pueblo. So the Pueblo people started farming in the San Juan Basin area. That's basically northwest New Mexico. At first, they would plant and then continue with their seasonal migrations, coming back to see if their corn grew. They would dig storage pits to keep any corn that grew so they could get back to it as they roamed. But then they thought, you know what we could also protect in these pits? Us! So they started making pit houses near the crops they were planting. We call those early Puebloan people the basket maker culture, after the baskets they were weaving to deal with their harvests. The chronology that archaeologists used to discuss Pueblo history was developed in the 1920s at the first Pecos conferences organized by Alfred Kidder. Before that, archaeologists were giving different names to the same things, and it was really confusing. Kidder got them all to agree to use the same chronology and classification system. We call that the Pecos classification, and we still use it today. Basically, it's broken up into three basket maker periods, followed by five Pueblo periods. Basket maker one was later changed to be called the Archaic. Basket maker two was when they first developed farming. Basket maker three is 500 to 750 CE, when they started permanently living in sedentary pit house villages and really committed to farming. And that commitment to sedentary farming is what led to the big change we call Pueblo I period. That's 750 to 900 CE. Two huge changes happened back then. One, they started making pottery instead of just baskets. The late basket maker people did make some pottery, but in Pueblo I, it became the dominant storage vessel type. The other big change was above-ground Pueblo-style housing. 
They were masonry and mud brick apartment compounds with square or rectangular room blocks. Multiple families would live in the same block of rooms and work together farming the land. This turned out to be a very successful adaptation to the region, and population surged. By the 700 CE, thousands of small Pueblo villages dotted the landscape. None of them were very big, a couple hundred people at most, and none of them lasted for very long. The people would build up a Pueblo village, stay there for 20 to 30 years, and then move to a new place. That frequent movement was part of their survival strategy. They would exhaust the resources of one area, and then, rather than trying harder and harder to eke out enough there, they would simply move. And so those thousands of villages, moving around through a limited but shared resource space, was the backdrop for the Pueblo II phase during which Chaco Canyon was built. So, oh gosh, I used up the first 11 minutes of this episode just to lead up to Chaco Canyon. Whose idea was it to make these episodes just 30 minutes long? Oh yeah, it was mine. And this is my podcast, so I guess I'll talk for as long as I want to. I'll get to the canyon right after this commercial break. The Ancient Maya Calendar. I'm fascinated by it. And though I've been studying it for decades, I still learn new things about it all the time. I call it ancient, but I and literally millions of modern Maya people are still tracking it into modern time. Towards that end, I've created two products to help people better understand it. My annual Maya wall calendar and an iPhone app called simply Maya Calendar. Through these tools, you can figure out today's date or tomorrow's or a Maya date thousands of years in the past. The app will even calculate your Maya birthday and tell you about your personality traits and destiny according to modern Maya daykeeper priests. The Maya calendar app is available through iTunes, but both it and my annual Maya wall calendar are available through my website, mayan-calendar.com. That's mayan with an n-calendar.com. Check it out. Okay, I'm back and ready to talk about Chaco Canyon itself. First, for those who have never been to Chaco Canyon or seen a map of it, it's not a city or a single place. Instead, the entire 10-mile stretch of the canyon is full of discrete features. Some are simple little farmsteads. Others are multi-story great houses with hundreds of rooms. Yet other parts hold great kivas, temples of sorts where hundreds could gather. There are also large stretches of rock art paintings and petroglyphs on the cliff walls. And it goes well beyond the canyon itself. There are great houses on the canyon rim with an impressive road system leading out in all directions to get more of what are called Chaco and Great Houses miles away. Altogether, it's been referred to as the Chaco Phenomenon. And it really was a phenomenon for a number of reasons. For one, just the sheer scale of what was built in a downright inhospitable part of the world. Heck, I've had days in Chaco Canyon when I was whipped just by walking around, and I didn't even build anything. Another is the sophistication of the architecture. The great houses in Chaco are amazingly well built and clearly master planned. The Pueblo people had built some nice room blocks before, but nothing like this. Then there's the road system, over 400 miles of roads clearly radiating from Chaco Canyon. And not little walking paths. I'm talking about fully engineered roads, straight as an arrow and prepared with curbs. The major ones can be 60 feet wide, like modern highways. And not to be forgotten are the astronomical alignments of Chaco Canyon. I'll spend most of part three of this episode discussing that. And perhaps strangest of all, the Chaco constructions seem barely used. The roads don't seem like they ever had much traffic, and the great houses were only inhabited for small portions of the year. Why would they build all that to barely use it? 
it's a mystery. But let's switch gears and talk about what we do know. This was actually not the first time people had occupied Chaco. There are basket maker and early Pueblo settlements found on the canyon floor. There is a shallow river running through the canyon. Not much, certainly not enough water for thousands of people, but enough to support a few small farming communities. But despite that, in the mid-800s, something amazing happened, a true transformation of Pueblo civilization. We know we're right about the timing because the Southwest has an enviable archaeological tool that few places in the world enjoy, and that's tree ring dating. Tree ring dating, or dendrochronology, is a technique through which we can tell exactly when a tree was cut down. If that tree became a beam in a Pueblo structure, we can say exactly what year that building was built, or at least when its materials were harvested. And since all the great houses were built of sandstone and timbers, and the dry desert never let the timber deteriorate, we can date them very precisely, down to the year. So we know that in the mid-800s, the first three great houses were built. Una Vida and Penasco Blanco on the ends of the canyon, and Pueblo Benito right in the middle. All three had a capital D shape, with a curving back wall and a straight wall along the front. In some ways, they were like the block room apartments the Pueblo people had made for generations. But the scale and sophistication were increased. Previous Pueblo complexes had around ten rooms each. The great houses had dozens, or in some cases even hundreds of rooms. Regular Pueblo walls were built of single courses of stone or mud bricks. The Chaco walls were built with a much more substantial core and veneer technique. Core and veneer walls are much thicker, with front and back faces of cut stone, and the middle or core filled with rubble. Many of the walls at Pueblo Benito are three feet thick. The great houses also incorporated circular kivas within the room blocks. Kivas are subterranean circular structures with a flat roof and a hole in the top with a ladder leading down inside. The interiors have benches along the walls and a fire pit just off center. The archaeological consensus is that kivas were shrines where religious ceremonies took place. And that's probably true at least for most kivas, though some have theorized that the smaller ones interspersed within the great house room blocks may have been family gathering places or places to stay warm during the coldest winter nights. Kivas existed before Chaco Canyon, probably evolving from the pit houses that the basket makers lived in, but the great houses had many, many more of them. Most were small and associated with the room blocks, but others were much larger and built in the middle of the great house plazas, obviously public gathering spaces. Yet other kivas in Chaco Canyon were standalone massive structures referred to as great kivas, and they were capable of holding hundreds of people at once. There are five in the canyon, but just one has been excavated and consolidated and that one's called Casa Rinconada. At 64 feet in diameter and 15 feet deep, Casa Rinconada was not built by a couple of guys on a camping trip. It took a massive crew of well-organized workers, led by skilled architects and engineers, to pull it off. Four huge columns held up its roof, which was made of a radial pattern of hundreds of long, straight tree trunks. Even just the stone bases of the columns weighed more than 1,000 pounds each. The roof itself was many tons. And all those tree trunks had to be hauled in to the canyon. Chaco doesn't have any tall trees, just scrubby little twisted ones. All told, for all the structures in Chaco Canyon, archaeologists estimate that it took 240,000 tree trunks. <laughs> 
and the closest forests are the Chuska and Zuni Mountains, both over 50 miles away. Can you imagine the labor force it took to do that? Smart archaeological detective work has proved that they were hauled in and stacked up in big material caches near the sites where the great houses would be built. Then, assumably, construction happened in one big phase once all the supplies were assembled. There were many other things brought in, clearly not from the canyon, notably turquoise and obsidian. Hundreds of thousands of pieces of those materials were found, many in workshops dispersed throughout the canyon. But again, we think that very few people lived in the canyon year-round. Most of those activities were done by people who came in for a very short time and lived somewhere else for most of the year. You might be asking, Ed, how do we know that? Well, let me explain. Over the roughly 300-year time span of Chaco's epogee, 16 major great house complexes were built. Collectively, they have enough rooms to house tens of thousands of people. And humans living year-round in a place for generations do two things that are easy to find archaeologically. They produce trash, and they die. But in Chaco's great houses, we don't find much evidence of either of those things. During the same time period, but well outside the canyon, there are thousands of Pueblo settlements, and 70 of them have great houses like Chaco Canyon. They all have the trash and the burials we would expect from a permanent settlement. But that's not so at Chaco Canyon. All of its great houses show this paucity of evidence. The largest one, Pueblo Benito, makes the case most clearly. Most of the great houses were built in a single phase with a few minor updates, but Pueblo Benito was rebuilt and expanded four times. At its height, it had at least 650 rooms, maybe 800. We're not sure because a huge rock ledge fell on its back end in 1941, before the room count occurred. It was called Threatening Rock, and one day in 1941, it made good on its threat, crushing a big section of Pueblo Benito. Whatever the exact room count, there was definitely space for thousands of people to have lived there over its centuries of use. But despite extensive excavations, only 60 burials were found in its floors. That number should have been in the hundreds or even the thousands. The incredible Chaco road system shows the same strange evidence of only minor use. Despite its size, sophistication, and extent, it was simply not used by any quantity of people on a regular basis. Lots of people trampling on a road, much less carrying 240,000 trees along it, cause damage that needs repair. But we just don't see that. There's enough potsherds and lithic refuse to say that Chaco Age people walked it, but not many and not often. And even though they generally radiate out of Chaco Canyon, or hone in, depending on your perspective, the roads don't actually connect to communities. The Great North Road, with two and sometimes four lanes, ends in an empty canyon. Smaller roads lead to valleys or small sources of water. They don't seem to function like mercantile or military roads would. So why the heck was all this built? When I get back from the commercial break, we'll try to tackle that question. This break is where commercials should go. But until I find people who'd like to buy the time, I'll just promote what I'm doing. If you like the cultures and places I'm talking about in this podcast, you should consider traveling with my colleagues and I. I'm the director of Maya Exploration Center a nonprofit dedicated to the better understanding of ancient American civilizations. We do that through things like this podcast, our website, public lectures, and educational travel programs like I just mentioned. If you'd like to find out more about how to get involved, or just give us a donation to continue our work, check us out at www.mayaexploration.org. 
That's mayaexploration.org. Okay, let's get talking about the why of Chaco Canyon. If you happen to be thinking, hold on, how about the how? Then you should reflect upon the prejudice of such a question. How? Because they were smart as hell, capable people. That's how. But why they would spend such incredible efforts and resources on a place they so infrequently occupied? Now that's a good question. Was it about wealth or power? Love? Fear? Hate? What about religion? Or politics? What exactly motivated the ancestral Pueblo people to build Chaco Canyon? Normally, a feat like Chaco Canyon takes strong, centralized leadership. That sort of thing is usually recognized by a big palace complex and elite residences, or military barracks, or a lavish temple complex. But Chaco has none of those things. Of the thousands of individual living spaces in Chaco Canyon, none are clearly bigger or better than the rest. You can't just look at the layers of any great house and say, ah, there's where the leaders lived. There is one exception to that statement, and it's the burials found in room 33 of Pueblo Benito. In the earliest, lowest level of burials there, probably from around the 800 CE, is a male person buried with thousands of turquoise beads and fancy ceramics. The room itself isn't much. In fact, it's in the dark recesses of Pueblo Benito's final phase. But excessive amounts of artifacts found there say that he was wealthy and important. Add to that the fact that other burials were interred in the same area over the next 200 years, mostly female. And what's cool is that seven out of the nine female burials found were DNA tested and turned out to be related to one another. Are they collectively proof of inherited leadership or an elite class at Chaco Canyon? I wish I could say yes, but it's the only burial site of its kind found in Chaco Canyon, hence an enigma, not a pattern. Another weird thing is the Mesoamerican artifacts found all over Chaco and especially in Pueblo Benito. Macaw skeletons are found in burials and offerings, and their natural habitat is the rainforest of southern Mexico. Not only are bones found, but also breeding pens and eggshells, so the people at Chaco were actually breeding macaws. The other clearly Mesoamerican thing found, believe it or not, was chocolate. Residues of chocolate was found in cylindrical vessels buried not far from Pueblo Benito's room 33. Again, cacao trees don't grow in the southwest. That chocolate had to come from, at very closest, the Mexican state of Tabasco, which is, coincidentally, about the limit of the macaw's natural habitat, too. So, was Chaco a trading post between Mesoamerica and the Southwest Pueblo people? Again, no, that doesn't make sense, and the artifact record does not support it. For one thing, while there are definite Mesoamerican artifacts, there's not much, not nearly enough to be called trade. For another, there's no sign of reciprocity. No Pueblo artifacts in Tabasco or anywhere south of Mexico's northern desert. In fact, the people of Chaco weren't even trading much with their close-by neighbors like the Hohokam and the Mogollon. Trade goods came into the canyon, but not much went out. If it did, we'd expect all those roads radiating out of Chaco to have much more use evidence. But again, they don't. And what about those expansive road systems? Most ancient cultures that made formal road systems, like the Romans or the Inca, did it for a variety of reasons. They were built for commerce and for ease of travel, but their primary purpose was for the armies that maintained and expanded the empire. And at their hearts were the capitals of Rome and Cusco, where they showcased their prestige and power. 
all roads lead to Rome, right? But that was definitely not what was going on in Chaco. There was no army, and there's no evidence that the ancestral Pueblo were dominating one another or their neighbors. There are no pieces of art exalting war. There are very few artifacts that we can identify as weapons, and there are no defensive constructions in Chaco Canyon. Certainly, if they were worried about attack, they wouldn't build at the bottom of a canyon with few natural resources. These strange circumstances that I just outlined hopefully give you some insight about why Chaco is considered a mystery. They also segue into a very impressive element of Chaco Canyon that I think may help us to understand what they were doing there. And that is its astronomical alignments. Until the 1970s, we really didn't know anything about Chaco in astronomy. A few people had noticed that some of the structures, like Casa Rinconada, had a cardinal direction orientation, but no one had seen any connections to the solastes and definitely not the moon. That all changed one day in June of 1977, when my friend and colleague Anna Sofar climbed up Fajada Butte and discovered what came to be called the Sun Dagger. She was an artist and part of a volunteer crew that was documenting Chaco's petroglyphs. She and her partner Jay Crotty hiked up to the top of a butte in the southern end of the canyon and found a pronounced spiral design etched into a rock face. Three big stone slabs stood on their ends in front of the spiral, blocking it from the sun. They decided to return the next day at a different time so they could get a better photo of it. But when she returned at noon the next day, she found the slabs were letting just a single knife or dagger of light through and that it was cutting right through the middle of that spiral, perfectly down its middle. Another person might not have thought anything of it, but luckily Anna had been following the recent astronomy discoveries at Stonehenge and the Maya city of Chichen Itza. June solstice had just recently occurred, so she wondered if the light strip on the spiral was intentional. The slabs definitely looked like humans had carefully placed them there. So she returned and observed, first at equinox, then at winter solstice, and then right on the day of summer solstice again. And as she suspected, there were different kinds of light effects on the spiral for each of those three solar stations. And that set artist Anna Sofar on a different life plan. The next year, she established a nonprofit called the Solstice Project, with the goal of studying Chaco and astronomy. She still leads it today, though its goals have now expanded to protection and preservation. I don't often promote things with this podcast, but I will happily do so for the Solstice Project. Please visit them at solsticeproject.org and support what they're doing if you can. They are amazing. Over the last 40 years, the Solstice Project has discovered a ton of solar and lunar alignments, both in and well beyond Chaco Canyon. It's way too much to fully explain here in this podcast, so I'm just going to summarize enough to make the point I'm hoping to make here. But if you want to know more in-depth info about Chaco astronomy, I have a whole 30-minute Great Courses lecture devoted to it, or I'd recommend Anna Sofar's book, Chaco Astronomy. Inspired by the discovery at Fajada Butte, Anna and now a team of other scholars began searching for solar alignments in the canyon's great houses. But at first, they really didn't find much. There's an interesting north-south line of buildings in the center of the canyon that are all aligned to cardinal directions. Pueblo Benito and Casa Rinconada on the canyon's floor, and Pueblo Alto and Sin Kletzen on the rims above. And while those orientations do indicate astronomy, since only observations or a magnetic compass could have determined them, lots of celestial objects will rise or set along that axis during the course of a year, so not particularly helpful. 
But Anna was working not just with gringo scholars, but also modern Pueblo people. They told her that the moon was just as important as the sun, and that if one was being observed, the other surely was too. And that was the perspective change they needed. Looking back at the other great houses, they found a bunch of lunar alignments, keyed not to a single year's observation, but the 18.6-year cycle of lunar minimums and maximums. The two early great houses on the ends of the canyon were both oriented to the lunar maximum or major standstill. Three others located closer in, but still on either side of the Pueblo Benito center line, were oriented to the lunar minor standstills. Yet more site-to-site alignments were found, some stretching for miles outside the canyon, and they were also on lunar orientations. Looking back at the Sun Dagger, it too had lunar capabilities, using shadow and moonlight to mark points on the spiral. And especially back in the 1980s, these discoveries were a big deal. Gerald Hawkins was still trying to prove that Stonehenge had lunar alignments, and none had been found in Mesoamerica or Mesopotamia yet. Anna's work was celebrated by some, but also criticized by others. Some archaeologists doubted that an artist with no formal archaeological training could have found what so many before her had missed. But then in 1988, an archaeologist named John McKim Malville, who incidentally was a critic of So Far's theories, documented our best evidence of Chacoan lunar alignments. It was at a Chacoan great house called Chimney Rock, well to the north of the canyon in southern Colorado. The site is up high on a mountainside and difficult to climb to. It was built with a great view of two nearby natural spires, a pair of them, and they're the chimneys of Chimney Rock. He thought at first that there was a summer solstice alignment between the site and the chimneys, but he didn't find any. But the year was 1988 and a lunar maximum year, and being aware of Anna's work, he waited to see what would happen. At 2 a.m. on August 8th of 1988, as he stood in the Chimney Rock Great Kiva, the lunar max full moon rose right between the two chimneys. But that was only part of Malville's awesome discovery. The Great Kiva there took a lot of work. All the wooden beams had to be hauled up the mountain, and because they're wood, tree ring dating tells us exactly what year they were cut down and hauled up to Chimney Rock. The Kiva's first phase roof was built in 1076. A second big expansion was built 18 years later in 1093. Both of those years were exactly lunar max years. That means that the kiva was built and then expanded for what was probably a ritual observation event. For me, the key piece of information is that they were actually built during the same year as the lunar max. People who did not live there gathered from elsewhere to build the observation point kiva together. So how does that relate back to Chaco Canyon and why it was built? I think it has to do with the timing of gatherings. As I explained earlier, the ancestral Pueblo people lived only in small communities widely dispersed across the region, a necessity born of the resource-poor environment of the San Juan Basin. When you look at the geographic boundaries of the region, you see that Chaco Canyon is almost dead center. Since they lived so far away from each other, They couldn't just say, hey, let's meet in three months or a hundred days from now. That message would take too much effort to communicate to thousands of communities. But no matter where they lived, they all saw the same sun and moon. Planning regional gatherings was likely done by timing them to solstices, equinoxes, and full moons. And thus major gatherings, like the Kiva construction events documented at Chimney Rock, may have been timed to the 18.6 lunar cycle. 
We know that large groups of pilgrims were intermittently meeting in Chaco Canyon, and they were hauling in materials to build the great houses, like the thousands of tall timbers. And we know that many of the great houses are oriented to the 18.6 year lunar full moon standstills. So finally, here's my theory. Maybe the building of the great houses was the ceremony, and the orientations commemorate the timing of the meetings. Nothing bonds a society like creating impressive monuments together. And I think for the ancestral Pueblo people, Chaco Canyon was just that. They started slow, meeting in the canyon and building together as a testimony to their cultural cohesion, their oneness. And they continued for 300 years, which, by the way, tree ring dating fully confirms. The building was the most intense about 1100 CE, but then the climate began to change. By 1130, the entire San Juan Basin was in a terrible drought. The regional population was forced to leave their homes. Some moved north to Mesa Verde area. Others moved to the river basins to the south and to the east. And when they moved, society fragmented and building at Chaco Canyon ceased. By 1150, Chaco became a ghost town, all but a handful of canyon basin farmers left. And there it would sit, unoccupied, until the Navajo took up residence in the 1600s. But that is a story for another podcast. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, produced, and distributed by me, Ed Barnhart. If you liked what you heard, then subscribe, like, share, comment, and do all those other things that I'm supposed to ask you to do. If you didn't, then don't do any of that stuff. And if you really liked it, support Archeo Ed through my Patreon account. I make these podcasts for free, but I am not opposed to financial support. Until next time, thanks for listening. All rights reserved. Copyright 2020.